Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral radiology series. This video is going to focus on the different factors that can affect x-rays and the radiographic images. So we have to start with two important definitions, intensity of the x-ray and energy of the x-ray beam. So intensity has to do with the quantity of electrons and the resultant number of photons. And this has a direct result on the density of the image. So radiographic density is reflected by the overall darkness of the image. So the image on the right is the result of a more intense x-ray, resulting in a denser and darker overall image as compared to the one on the left. Energy, on the other hand, has to do with the quality of electrons and resultant energy of the photons. So this has a direct result on the contrast of the image. So image contrast refers to how many different gray values are used in the image. So you can detect certain changes that are going on. So this first image has a moderate amount of contrast. And you can still tell the difference between the enamel the dentin and the pulp layers, but the second image has arguably a bit more contrast and you can perhaps more easily see the caries on this tooth on the interproximal surface thanks to that additional contrast. One way to remember these is that the intensity and density, those two words, share the same six letters at the end of those words. So that's kind of how I like to remember intensity goes with density and then that leaves energy and contrast being paired together. So now we'll discuss some common factors that relate to the radiographic exposure and how we can modify both the intensity of the x-ray beam as well as the energy of the x-ray beam depending on what we want out of our image. So exposure time refers to the length of time measured in seconds that high voltage is applied to the x-ray tube and the time during which the tube current flows and x-rays are produced. So this setting impacts beam intensity, so the number of electrons and the number of resultant photons. Exposure time is the one setting that is most frequently changed. You can change exposure time with literally a click of the button, and so this is something that they could ask on the board exam. Modulating the exposure time is very easy to do. So bigger patients, uh, adult patients, typically for those kind of patients, the exposure time is going to be increased. We're going to increase that exposure time. For smaller patients, edentulous patients, patients without teeth, and children, the exposure time is decreased. So this number can also be decreased when uh, direct digital sensors are used because they're more efficient than the classical traditional film or the PSP plates. So if, if exposure time is too long, let's say you have a small child and you have that exposure time set too long for them, you're going to get an overexposed dark image. If it's too short, you get a noisy underexposed light image. So note that all the graphs that I'm going to be using for the next few slides are set up exactly the same. So intensity is graphed on the y-axis, that's the number of photons, and energy is going to be graphed on the x-axis. So here you can tell we're directly impacting the intensity. The photon energy stays the same from 0 to 70, it's just the relative number of photons that's increasing as we change this from one second to two seconds of exposure time. Okay, so tube current is measured in milliamperes, and that refers to the flow of electrons through the x-ray tube from the filament to the anode, and then back to the filament again. So this setting usually cannot be adjusted, or at least adjusted easily, but if the current were to increase, the number of x-ray photons generated at the anode increases linearly without changing the beam energy. So similar to the last one, the energy stays the same, it's the intensity of the beam that's changing. 
So this causes a higher number of photons to reach the receptor, and this increases the density and darkness of the image, as we would expect. Intensity goes with density. So too much tube current, again, we're going to have a too dark, overexposed image. Too little tube current, a noisy, underexposed image. Very similar to exposure time, those two are intimately linked together. Okay, how about tube potential? So tube potential is measured in peak kilovoltage. So peak kilovoltage is the measuring for this one, and it refers to the acceleration of electrons from the cathode to the anode, which is responsible for generating those photons like we saw in the first video. When the KVP increases, both the number as well as the energy of the x-ray photons generated at the anode increase. So this means that not only do we have an increased number of photons hitting the receptor, but also an increased energy of the photon beam. So not only is there an in increased number of photons, but also an increased number of photons with higher energies that are reaching the receptor, which leads to an overall increase of density at a greater scale compared to just increasing either the tube current or the exposure time. So we're increasing both intensity and energy as we increase that tube potential. So if it's too high, the image will be too gray with not enough white-black contrast. And the photons will mostly interact with their target by Compton scattering, and we'll talk more about that in the next video. If the tube potential is set too low, the image will be overall too light, and the contrast will be way too high. So the photons, in this case, would mostly interact by photoelectric absorption. And again, we'll talk more about these two terms in the next video. It's called peak kilovoltage because it's defined as the maximum voltage of an x-ray beam. It's usually set between uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 kilovolts, and increasing that maximum energy will also increase the mean energy of the beam. And the average is usually somewhere around one-third, whatever that maximum setting is. So the big thing here, messing around with two potential is going to affect both intensity, so it's going to affect both our density as well as the energy, so it's also going to affect the contrast of the image. Filtration is a normal mechanism built into most dental x-ray units used today, and we briefly talked about this in the last video. Any x-ray beam will consist of a range of photon energies from low energy to high energy, and aluminum, or sometimes copper, preferentially filters out all of the low energy photons, reducing the overall beam intensity, and therefore reducing the dose that the patient receives, while also improving the image quality because we're filtering out those low energy photons that we don't necessarily want. So at the same time, it also increases the mean energy of the beam, as we can see here, by filtering out all of those low energy photons that are all down here. So this is conceptually similar to the phenomenon of beam hardening, which refers to filtering or attenuating out the low energy photons, so getting rid of these photons down here, and keeping the high energy photons, thus hardening the x-ray beam, allowing it to penetrate that human tissue more effectively. So collimation is something else that we have to talk about, and a collimator is a metallic barrier. It's usually made out of lead, and it reduces the scatter radiation by limiting the size of the x-ray beam. Specifically, they'll reduce the size of the x-ray beam to either a 7-centimeter diameter circle, in the case 
of a round collimator or an area just larger than the image receptor in the case of a rectangular collimator, which is generally the preferred type. And this is to reduce unnecessary patient exposure. So a less effective collimator is going to result in this wide beam that gets a lot more tissue exposure than necessary. A more effective collimator is going to narrow that x-ray beam to a more effective and logical dimension. So scatter radiation, otherwise known as noise, reduces image contrast. So not only does collimation reduce unnecessary patient exposure, but it also, just like filtration, improves the image quality. So now we can finally talk about this part, the position indicating device. We saw this in the last video. It's also sometimes called the PID for short. And they're highly recommended because they help to line up the x-ray beam properly. You would line this part up right up against the patient's face in line with where your receptor is. And it also provides built-in collimation. So this one would be an example of round collimation because that opening is circular. These ones here, you can tell they're rectangular in dimension. And so those are examples of rectangular collimators. Important for the board exam, the greatest decrease in radiation to a patient is achieved by collimation, specifically rectangular collimation. It's the best method to reduce radiation dose. So for example, for a full mouth series of 18 images, just having a re rectangular collimator instead of a round collimator cuts the radiation dose by five times. By 500% it cuts that radiation dose. So just having a rectangular collimator is a massive improvement to that dose. So if you're asked the best way to reduce radiation dose on the exam, it's not changing the type of film or using a thyroid collar or using an aluminum filter or changing the voltage or amperage settings, it's collimation. That's the answer I would select for that question. So distance from the source of x-rays is also an important consideration. And usually that position indicating device or PID is placed right up against the patient's face, but we have to consider how long the entire system is because we know the beam's actually being produced up in the tube head, not in that position indicating device. So the beam intensity at a given point is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. So this is known as the inverse square law. Basically, the further the object is from the source, in this case, the patient's teeth, the less photons you'll have per unit area. So remember, a receptor starts out being completely white, and then the more x-ray beams that reach the receptor means you're gonna get an overall darker image. That just means more photons are contacting that plate. Less means that the image stays lighter just like that. So the further away we are from that source, the lighter image we're getting. By this logic too, the operator should be at least six feet away to avoid unnecessary exposure. So let's take a closer look at some of these distance related terms that can appear on the board exam. So we have the x-ray anode back here. That's where the x-rays are actually being produced. That's our source. And we have the position indicating device with the built-in lead collimator. In this case, it's circular. And we have the tooth here, which is our object. And we have the film or the digital sensor back here, which is where our image is being collected. So we'll call that the image. So we have the source or sometimes the target, we have the object, and we have the image. And again, remember the PID isn't the source, it's up here in the middle of the tube head. Okay, so with those terms out of the way, we can define these certain distances. We have the source to object distance. We can all also call that the SOD, 
we have the object to image distance. We can call that the OID. And then we have the source to image distance, this entire thing combined, which is the SID. Now, sometimes we also call this one down here the uh, focal film distance, the FFD. And so that's sometimes interchangeably used because the focal spot is where the x-rays are produced. So sometimes the focal spot is used interchangeably with the source or the target. I know it can be a little bit confusing, but target, source, focal are sometimes used interchangeably. All right, so when the source to object distance, this SOD, increases, the intensity of the x-ray beam decreases following that inverse square law. So this results in an uh, in a decrease in the overall image density, like we just talked about in the last slide. However, there's also a secondary effect. The larger that this SOD is, let's say we have a really elongated PID that automatically arranges the beam further away from the teeth, you'll also get a sharper image. The smaller that this OID is, so the detector is as close as possible to the teeth, you also get a sharper image as well as less magnification. So all of those things, a sharper image, less magnification, this is all some, these are all very desirable traits that we want for our image. Now you can test all this out on your own if you wanted to. All you need is a flashlight, an object like a pencil, or a piece of chapstick and a wall to project the image onto. So what you do for this experiment is to turn the flashlight on and hold it with one hand pointing at the wall. Then you'd hold the object with the other hand between the flashlight and the wall. And the closer you bring that flashlight to the object, you'll notice that the shadow on the wall gets blurrier and larger. The further away you draw that flashlight from the object, within reason, the shadow gets smaller and sharper. Likewise, the further the object is from the wall, the blurrier and larger the shadow gets. And the closer the object is to the wall, within reason, the shadow once again gets smaller and it gets sharper. And this perfectly demonstrates what we want out of our x-ray beam and how we set these distances up. What we want is the maximum SOD and the minimum OID, which gives the best results via the sharpest image and the lowest magnification. We can also talk about this in terms of geometry. So spatial resolution, which is the ability to differentiate between two points on an image, is also limited by geometric unsharpness. So we have two more terms that we need to define here. Umbra refers to the shadow directly behind an image. This is where no light gets to at all. Again, you can think back to our example, holding up that flashlight with, the, with an object between the flashlight and the wall. The penumbra is the side shadow. This occurs around the umbra, and it's where some light is present, but not a whole lot of light. So it looks a bit fuzzy, kind of like the fuzzy outside. Uh, it's, it's fuzzy, it's outside to that dark, no light shadow part that's directly behind the object. The size of that penumbra depends on three things. The focal spot size, the source to object distance, and the object to image distance. So a smaller, we, we talked about these two already, the smaller a focal spot is, which means the smaller that light source is, for example, the size of an x-ray beam, the smaller that is, it'll produce a smaller penumbra and thus a sharper image. The penumbra is what we don't want. That's basically making our image look blurry and not as clear. So if we had a smaller flashlight, 
or a smaller x-ray beam in terms of its diameter, we're going to have less penumbra we have to worry about and just an overall better image quality. So the size of the penumbra or the blurriness of an image can be uh, explained by a very simple equation. That would be the size of the focal spot divided by the source to object distance. And then we could also throw in the numerator the object image distance. because we want these top two numbers to be as small as possible. We want this one to be as big as possible. And so our blurriness will be as low as possible if we abide by those numbers. And just like on the last slide, you can test all of this out with a flashlight and a pencil, for example. And I suppose if you had multiple flashlights, you could try out different size flashlights and even see that phenomenon. So it's really cool how you can just uh, bring this to real life and be able to see this in front of your eyes. And really, I think that'll really help all these concepts kind of sync together for you. So as you can see, the geometry is the limiting factor for sharpness and definition. It's all about those distances and how we use and how we arrange all of the parts of this puzzle. It's not necessarily the sensor or the receptor that's responsible for this. So here's an awesome summary slide putting everything together for you. We have our two big categories of intensity and energy of the X-ray beam up here. And then we have five categories from exposure time through distance that we can manipulate to change either the intensity or the energy of the x-ray beam. Now, some of these things are easier to change, like the distance or the exposure time, but technically all of these things can be manipulated, particularly if the board exam asks you to. So for example, we can just go across a row here, and if we increase the exposure time, we're going to increase the density, have no effect on the energy. If we were to increase the peak kilovoltage, we would increase density, but we would lose some image contrast. If we increase the filtration, we would decrease density of that image, but increase contrast of the image. So that's how the chart can be used. So if you got a question on the board exam that asked you, what are some reasons that this image is underexposed, which means it's too light, too grainy, or in other words, not dense enough, well, then we would go through the chart and we would basically flip these arrows around because if we have a decreased density, that means, well, we would have a, an exposure time that's too short. Maybe we have a tube current that's too small. We have a tube potential that could be too low. And then these arrows are pointing in the right direction. So that would mean that the filtration was too strong or maybe the source to object distance was too far. Another example of a question could be, uh, what are some reasons that this image has poor contrast? Well, we could say too low contrast, that means that the tube potential was too high, or if we flip this arrow around, the filtration was too weak. And so those are examples of how you can use this table to help answer a lot of the high yield focused board questions that you'll get. Now, I, I really do think that most of the high yield information that will be tested on for those radiology questions outside of interpretation, which we'll focus on in a separate video, this video has most of the good information that you need for these kind of questions. So that's it for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting me and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.